Hello, my name is Berit Hildebrandt and I'm an ancient historian. First, I want to thank the organizers of this conference for their kind invitation. Also, I'm grateful to the numerous colleagues who, over the years, have generously shared their knowledge about silk with me. I also want to thank Professor Andreas schmidt collinet for kindly granting me permission to use his photographs. Full bibliographical references for the translations of ancient texts are listed at the end of this presentation. If no reference is given, the translation is mine. Today, I will speak about the terminology of silks and texts of the Roman Empire, qualities, origins, products, and uses. Towards the end of the first century BCE, Greek and Latin texts increasingly referred to a new textile material that quickly gained popularity among Roman women and men, and even some of the emperors who did not care about traditional Roman clothing that was usually made of wool or linen, silk. Moralizing authors complained that silk clothing inappropriately revealed the bodies of their wearers, especially married women. Moreover, they saw silk that needed to be imported from people unknown even to trade as a threat to the Roman economy because it was very expensive. A close reading of laws and code poetry, however, shows that these negative discourses presented only one side. Almost from the beginning of the imperial period, silk served as an important means of self-representation for the highly competitive Roman elites, including Roman men. While in the early years of the Roman imperial period, only bad emperors were purportedly interested in silk, the emperors of late antiquity increasingly tried to monopolize the silk trade and manufacture, as well as the use of the most precious silks. The purple dyed silk mantle even became the symbol of imperial rule. In contrast, information about the characteristics, qualities, origins, and forms of silks is much scarcer and often only indirectly attested to in the written sources. The following analysis seeks to gather the scattered evidence in Greek and Latin texts with a focus on the first century BCE to the fourth century CE. My aim is to build a framework for later comparisons with archeological silk finds and silk terminologies and other languages along the silk roads, which in turn can shed light on the origin, transmission, and exchange of silks in antiquity. The written sources are treated here thematically according to their information about different kinds of silks, their origins, colors, patterns, and other decoration. Of the extant texts regarding silk, moralizing literature, both pagan and Christian, far outnumbers texts on trade, court poetry, and legal texts. The picture we gather from the text is therefore incomplete and distorted. In order to get an idea about the differences between texts and archaeological textiles, the excellently preserved and thoroughly published silk finds of the Syrian oasis city Palmyra, Tadmor, will be used for a comparative case study. Unfortunately, it is beyond the scope of this paper to provide an overview over the extant silk finds in the Mediterranean and the former Roman provinces, a catalog of which is still a desideratum. They will be the focus of a separate study. Palmyra yielded over 2000 textile fragments which belonged to over 500 different fabrics. Around 100 of them were made of silk. They were all found in seven of the splendid tower tombs of Palmyra's West Necropolis. You see one of them in the lower left corner and date from the first century BCE to the second century CE. Their materials consist of fibers that were traditionally used in the Eastern Mediterranean, like for example, flax, hemp, wool, and other animal fibers, but also imported fibers like silk, wild silk, and cotton. The silks consist mostly of cultivated Chinese mulberry silk and a smaller group of wild silks from wild silkworm species. I will come back to them. Because the textiles were protected from light, many of them have preserved their original splendid colors, as you can see in the red silk to the right. 
The majority of these textiles was cut in pieces and wrapped around the mummified bodies of the deceased. Some of them even seem to have been cut in stripes and used as decorative borders on clothing before they were used as mummy wraps. It is therefore difficult to reconstruct the original shapes of the silk fabrics. Also, it is important to keep in mind that these textiles represent the wealth of the richest families in a tomb context. They can tell us which silk fabrics reached the Mediterranean, but not whether and how they were used beyond Palmyra. Ancient Greek and Latin texts know three terms for silk, bombucinum, or in the plural bombucina, sericum, or in the plural serica, and metaxa, all of which are still used in late antiquity. Bombucinum refers etymologically to the insect that produces silk called bombux. The earliest evidence for the use of bombucina is usually assumed to be a passage in Aristotle's Historia Animalium from the fourth century BCE that describes the life cycle of a silkworm and attributes the invention of silk production to a woman on the Greek island of Kos. Aristotle says, out of a certain large lava, there arises first of all a caterpillar produced when the lava metamorphoses, then a bombylus, cocoon, then out of this, a nekudalos, probably the moth. It goes through all these transformations in six months. Some of the women actually unwind the cocoons from these creatures by reeling the thread off and then weave a fabric from it. The first to do this weaving is said to have been a woman of course, named Pamphile, daughter of Plates. This text stands in a long tradition of Greek writers that attempt to find the first inventor of craft techniques. The problem with this passage is that it has no securely dated parallels until an inscription from a sanctuary in Miletus in modern day Turkey that mentions head and face coverings made of bombukina silk. This inscription is dated to the end of the second or the beginning of the first century BCE. It is thus safe to assume that this kind of silk reached the Mediterranean at least during the Hellenistic period. The term was more frequently used from the last third of the first century BCE on and might have originally referred to wild silks since it is always attributed to insects. Usually when we think of silk, we think of the white, shiny, even threads produced by the cultivated Chinese silkworm that feeds on white mulberry leaves called bombux mori. But there are numerous other silk moth species all over the world that can produce silk. These species are usually not cultivated and live in the wild. Their products are called wild silk or tassa. Wild silk threads are uneven in comparison with cultivated mulberry silk and the fabrics made of them usually come in different natural beige or brown shades and are coarser and less shiny. Because the moth is not killed before it hatches from the cocoon, as is the case with cultivated silk, it breaks through the long silk threads that are boned around the cocoon. Therefore, wild silk needs to be spun and was often used for simpler, monochrome or undyed silk fabrics. Cultivated silk might have given rise to another term for silk in Greek and Latin texts that became popular around the same time like bombucinum in the last third of the first century BCE. Sericum, that is probably related to the Chinese word for silk, and the producers and traders in the East, the Ceres, which literally means the silk people. The plural form Serica denotes both fabrics and garments. This period coincides with the conquest of Egypt by the Romans in 30 BCE that gave access to the important maritime trade routes to India through the Red Sea and the Western Indian Ocean that are described in a trader's handbook from the first century CE, the Periplus Maris Eritrei, the circumnavigation of the Red Sea, that discusses trade around the modern day Red Sea, the Western Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf. We will come back to it. Sericum is until late antiquity likened to or confused with plant fibers. 
like linen or tree wool, probably cotton, which shows that its origin was as mysterious to Roman authors as the people who produced it. The text of the poet Virgil from the last third of the first century BCE is such an example. He writes that the Ceres come soft flocks from leaves. A commentator from the fourth century CE, Servius, corrected him, stating, in Ethiopia, at the Indians and Ceres, there are certain worms in the trees that are also called bombukes, and which draw out very fine threads in the way spiders do. This is where silk sericum comes from, because we cannot assume that it is tree wool, cotton, which is produced everywhere. This also implies that silk was still very exclusive at this time and could not be acquired everywhere. From the second century CE on, a third term for silk becomes more frequent, metaxa. It has been suggested that it indicates white silk, but rather it seems to have referred to silk skeins. That means some form of loosely called strings of silk made, made from the silk threads that were unreeled and or gathered from the cocoon. The late antique author Isidore of Seville writes, Mataxa, as if it was called Metaxa, derives from the circling of the threads because meta refers to the driving around the goal in the circus, or it derives from the fact that the thread is transferred. Isidore likens the circling of Metaxa threads to driving around a goal in the circus, probably referring to the winding, the unreal threads around something so that they formed oval skeins. These skeins could be used for the transport of the raw material that could be further processed at its destination through dyeing, plying, and spinning. From the third century CE on, we also find distinctions between half silk subserica, and entirely silken fabrics, holocerica. While holocericum seems to have originated in the Greek East, possibly coined by traders at the western ends of the silk roads, the etymology of subsericum points to a Latin origin, which might be related to the luxury discourses around silken textiles, for which half silken garments were regarded as a compromise. The term coivestes, garments from the Greek island of Kos, was popular among Latin poets in the first centuries BCE and CE. However, they do not specify the material. The term is often related to Pamphili of Kos, who purport purportedly invented silk weaving. We find the story in the text attributed to Aristotle that we have already seen. But since the term is unclear and not used in legislation or texts on trade, it will not be included in this discussion. While ancient texts usually do not specify which materials were used for mixed silk fabrics, with the exception of Isidore of Seville, who mentions silk and linen, a few textile finds from Palmyra show combinations of silk and wool, silk and flax, and even silk and cotton. You see examples on the slide. According to the textile specialists who analyze, analyze these finds, the combination with silk could make mixed fabrics very supple and light, comparable to the quality and value of modern cashmere fabrics. Ancient texts claim that both Metaxa and Serica were produced by the Ceres, who are often translated as Chinese but rather refer to any people dealing with silk. The Periplus Maris Eritrei mentions an unknown country to the north of India, Tina, that probably denotes the Han Chinese Empire, from where Serica were traded to India by land and river and then further to the west. Beyond this region, Nyland, cruising near the Ganges River, by now at the northernmost point where the sea and somewhere on the outer fringe, there is a very great inland city called Tinya, from which floss, yarn, and silk cloth are shipped by land via Bactria to Barugaza and via the Ganges River back to Limurike. It is not easy to get to this Tina, 
for rarely do people come from it and only a few. The serica came in different forms, probably as floss, yarn, called nema in Greek, and fabric. The terminology is unclear though. From the second century on, the origin of serica is increasingly attributed also to India, while bombukina attributed to the Ceres, Ethiopia and India by ancient authors, as we have seen in Servius commentary on Virgil, they were also located on the Greek island of Kos, referring to the already mentioned story of Pamphile in Arabia and Assyria. However, the texts do usually not distinguish between the regions of production and the places of trade, and ancient authors do not always use geographical attributions correctly. To get a clearer picture of the actual fabrics that reached the Mediterranean, it is therefore necessary to turn to archaeological finds, which suggest that both China and India produced silk at least from the third millennium BCE on. India probably wild silks and China mainly cultivated Bombyx mori silk. Both could therefore be considered as providers of silk for the Roman Empire. The majority of the silk, find, uh, silk finds from Palmyra, 80%, was made of Bombyx mori mulberry silk and originated in China. As is typical for Chinese silks, the warp thread dominates the pattern and not the weft thread like in Western fabrics. Chinese silk terminology distinguishes between a wealth of different weaving techniques, among others plain, coarse and twill pattern tabby weaves, damasks, gauzes, crepe, taquete, and incised silk or silk tapestry, as well as polychrome silks. Next to cultivated Bombyx mori silk, China might also have produced wild tassa silk. Among the Chinese silk finds in Palmyra, we find three different kinds that differ in technique, color, and iconography. The biggest group consists of monochrome warp face tabbies made of densely woven fine mulberry silk threads, like the example in the middle. The second group consists of so-called Han damasks. That means warp-faced monochrome tabbies with patterns that are visible from a certain angle and consist of typical Chinese elements like masks, jade rings, and lozenges, like the embroidered example to the left. The third, even smaller group, consists of warp-faced compound tabbies. These silks are the most elaborate fabrics of their time. You see an example to the right with distinctly Chinese designs. Finally, one outstanding silk was woven as a warp-faced compound tabby that is typical for Chinese silks, but with Western iconographic elements that show men harvesting grapes and animals under wines. Moreover, the fabric displays characteristics that suggest that the weaver was not very familiar with the weaving technology, probably still adapting to it. It might have been produced in Syria. Six of the silks found in Palmyra consisted of wild silk that might have originated in India. Ancient Indian texts distinguish between native wild silks and imported silk from China or Central Asia, as did the Periplus Maros Eritrei text that we have already seen. Although it has been claimed that there was an indigenous wild silk production in the Mediterranean from the fourth century BCE on, based on the text attributed to Aristotle, there is currently not enough written or archeological evidence to prove it. Rather, it seems that silk cultivation reached the Mediterranean only in the 6th century CE. This would also explain the persistent confusion of serica with plant fibers. It was only at that time when, according to the author Procopius, silkworm eggs and the knowledge of sericulture was smuggled into Byzantium by monks from the east so that the emperor Justinian became independent from Persian and other silk traders. Emperor Justinian entertained the desire that the Romans should no longer purchase silk from the Persians. Later, the monks brought back the eggs to Byzantium 
and in the manner described caused them to be transformed into worms, which they fed on the leaves of the mulberry, and thus they made passable from that time forth the production of silk in the land of the Romans. We can summarize so far that many different kinds of silks were available in the Mediterranean, both cultivated and wild silk, and fabrics in different colors and techniques. Also, we have seen that Greek and Latin terminology distinguished between wild and cultivated silk, half silk and pure silk fabrics, as well as silk skeins, yarns and woven fabrics. However, is there any indication that Greek and Latin were able to mirror the rich variety of woven silks that reached the Mediterranean? The only explicit reference to different kinds of silk qualities is found in a poem of the first century poet Marshall, who lists precious gifts for a girlfriend, among others, first quality silk, in Latin prima serica. But let my mistress demand from me a pound of nard or emeralds, or a pair of sardonyxes, and not look at any but prime silk from the Tuscan street or let her back a hundred gold coins, just as if they were pens. It remains unclear though, which criteria were applied to distinguish between these silk qualities. The color, fineness and evenness of the thread might have played a role and could be connected to the differences between wild and cultivated silk fibers. The former usually resulting in coarser and less shiny fabrics than the latter. However, Marshall, does not use the already mentioned terms bombukina and serica that seem to have denoted the differences between wild and cultivated silk. That these terms were seen as different is corroborated by authors like Apuleius and Clement of Alexandria, who wrote in the second century CE and who used bombukina and serica in parallel. Also legal texts distinguished between garments of wool and linen and those made of serica and Bombukina, although without explaining the difference between the two. Taking this into consideration, we have to consider that Marshall thought about different qualities of Serica. He could have referred to different silk qualities gathered from one and the same cocoon, like the short threads from the outside and inside of a cocoon, as opposed to the high quality, long and even thread that can be unreeled from its middle part. Yet another possibility is that plant fibers like cotton were subsumized under serica and regarded as lesser quality silk. In his description of India, the ancient geographer Strabo writes that wool from trees was used to weave fine fabrics and to pad saddles, and that serica are of the same kind, namely a certain kind of bark named bussos, a Greek term for linen and cotton. For the same reason, the Indian heat, even wool blossoms on some trees. From this wool, Nearchus says, finely threaded cloths are woven, and the Macedonians use them for pillows and up as padding for their saddles. The serica are also of this kind, byssos, being dried out of certain barks. While it is not possible to determine what ancient authors meant when they spoke about different silk qualities, we are on safer ground with regard to their descriptions of silk fabrics. Many early texts, starting from the second half of the first century BCE, address the revealing qualities of silks that made the luxurious material that was imported from unknown people not only very expensive, but also immoral. A prime example is a text by the philosopher Seneca, in which he lets the philosopher Demetrius criticize the Roman matron's predilection for serica garments. I see their raiments of silk, if that can be called raiment, which provides nothing that could possibly afford protection for the body, or indeed modesty, so that when a woman wears it, she can scarcely with a clear conscience swear that she is not naked. 
These are imported at vast expense from nations unknown even to trade in order that our married women may not be able to show more of their persons, even to their paramours, in a bedroom than they do on the street. The revealing quality of Serica is also typical for Bombukina. The second century author Apuleius describes a beautiful young woman in such a mantle that reveals her body contours, either because a wind is lifting it away from it or pressing it against it, and thus delineating her forms. She displayed a perfect figure, he says, her body naked and uncovered except for a mantle of sheer silk with which she veiled her comely charms. An inquisitive little breeze would at one moment blow this veil aside in one playfulness so that it lifted to reveal the flower of her youth. And at another moment, it would gust exuberantly against it so that it clung tightly and graphically delineated her body's voluptuousness. Apuleius' description suggests that the material was so delicate and subtle that it could be easily lifted by a breeze, but also cling tightly to its wearer's body. We can further assume that fine, high quality silks were highlighting the body contours of their wearers through their shine. The Augustan poet Ovid, for example, likens the long, exquisite hair of a lover to the silk fabrics of the Ceres, evoking notions of lightness, delicateness, and shine. These kinds of silks were probably revealing because they were subtle, not because they were loosely woven and diaphanous. In the first century CE, the author Plutarch is discussing an object that is at the same time light, lepton in Greek, and thick, pugnon in Greek. My friend, what is there to prevent the same thing from being both tenuous and dense, like the silken, serica, and linen, bucina, varieties of cloth? Here we see again how closely interlinked silk and fine plant fibers were in the perception of ancient authors. It is possible that these silks consisted of densely woven tabby fabrics made of delicate and shiny Bombux mori silk, maybe similar to those found in Palmyra. Another possibility is that the revealing silk dresses consisted of loosely woven gauze-like fabrics that allowed views of the body underneath. In Palmyra, a half silken, very fine wool and silk fabric has been found that could have provided such an effect. The poet Lucan might have had these gauze-like fabrics in mind when he lets the Egyptian queen Cleopatra seduce Caesar in a purple dyed silk garment that let her white breasts shimmer through. There the sovereign sat down and with them Caesar, greater than they, Cleopatra, not content with the crown of her own and her brother for husband, was there with her baleful beauty painted up beyond all measure. Covered with the spoils of the Red Sea, pearls, she carried a fortune round her neck and in her hair and was weighed down by her ornaments. Her white breasts were revealed by the fabric of cedar, alluding to purple dye, which close woven with a weaving comb of the Ceres, the Egyptian needle worker pulls out and loosens the thread by stretching the stuff. It is also difficult to assess whether these very thin silks were used throughout antiquity. A passage in the Historia Augusta, probably written in the fourth century CE, claims that the emperor Commodus who lived in the second half of the second century, appeared in public in a silken garment that was obviously fine enough to reveal for all to see details of his groin, which was highly inappropriate. Indeed, he had such a conspicuous growth on his groin that the people of Rome could see the swelling through his silken robes, says the text. It is impossible to say though, whether the author described a historical event or wanted to assassinate the emperor's character. We have, however, evidence that light silks were valued despite their possible transparency. Silk garments were able to distract from a badly executed dance performance, as we learn from the author Lucian, who quotes a critic. 
People were duped by the accessories of the business, the silk vestment, the beautiful mask, the flute and its quavers, and the sweet voices by, of the singers, by all of which the dancer's business, itself amounting to a nothing at all, was embellished. This testifies to the aesthetic properties of the flattering fine silk garments that must have been an integral part of the dance. Finally, silks were appreciated for their temperature balancing properties. Pliny the Elder complains that men prefer to wear bombic silk garments in summer because of their lightness, which he thought was effeminate and untraditional. He says, nor have even men been ashamed to make use of these bombic dresses because of their lightness in summer. So far have our habits departed from wearing a leather cuirass that even a rope is considered a burden. The popularity of silk, despite of critical voices, also occupied the Roman Senate in 16 CE during the reign of the Emperor Tiberius. At the next session, Tacitus lets us know, the ex-consul Quintus Haterius and Octavius Fronto, a former praetor, spoke at length against the national extravagance. And it was resolved that table plate should not be manufactured in solid gold and that oriental silks should no longer degrade the male sex. It was decided after a purportedly heated discussion that men should be forbidden to wear silk garments. This restriction was probably not very successful because the rhetoric teacher Quintil Jan writes in the second half of the first century CE, I'm ready to go so far along the path of concession, but let no man press me further. I concur in the fashion of the day to the extent of agreeing that the toga should not be of coarse wool, but not to the extent of insisting that it should be of silk can only guess how many Roman citizens infuriating, infuriated the moralists by wearing the traditional garment of a Roman citizen, the toga, not in the traditional version made of wool, but of silk. Quintilian is an exception among the earlier authors that write about silk clothes, in that he mentions the passable shape of the silk garment. Usually, early texts only speak of serica or bombukina, which could refer to silk fabrics or garments of different qualities and shapes. In late antiquity, texts become more specific, both with regards to the kinds of silks used and the garments made of them. In the Emperor Diocletian's edict on maximum prices dated to the year 301 CE, we find several references to silk garments the maximum price of which varies according to whether they were made of half silk, subserica, or entirely of silk, holoserica. The salary for a silk weaver for half silk fabrics plus keep was 25 denarii maximum. The salary for a silk weaver for pure silk fabrics plus keep also 25 denarii maximum. The salary for a silk weaver for pure silk damasks, however, plus keep, was 40 denarii. Here we learn about weaving techniques. Those who received a lower wage were probably producing tabby weaves. Those who received a higher wage, scutlata silks. These silks have been identified as damasks with a geometric pattern by John Peter Wilde. We also learn from the edict about tapestry weavers, plumarii and barbaricarii, who embellished silks, the latter with gold thread, as well as spinners who spun probably wool purple threads, probably for weaving them into silk fabrics. At Palmyra, a precious mulberry silk tunic from the tom tomb of Elabel dated to 103 CE and woven in Damascus technique had inwoven stripes made of purple dyed silk here left in the picture. It was probably woven in Syria with imported Bombux Mori silk yarns. The other example is a green damask that was probably woven earlier than the tunic because it shows numerous weaving mistakes here to the right on the slide. 
Among the kinds of silk clothes that are mentioned in Diocletian's Edict on Maximum Prices are also a tunic with sleeves and hypoblata purple stripes, made of half silk fabric, dimatica, a long garment with sleeves, estrictoria, in half silk or pure silk quality, and a hooded garment with sleeves, a dalm dalmaticum or fortium, made either of half silk or pure silk with different qualities of purple stripes. These silk fabrics have probably been of a more solid quality than the highly revealing silks of the early imperial period. This assumption is corroborated by passages in the Historia Augusta, where silk garments are given to subordinates by the emperors. An example is the later emperor Claudius Gothicus, who received, among many other garments, a half silk white garment with purple dye from the emperor Val Valerian. Also Valerian's son Gallienus tried to win Claudius over by sending him numerous gifts that included a white half silk dress. Since it would not make sense to assume that the emperors dealt out clothes that disgraced their wearers, we can rule out diaphanous fabrics. These subserica were probably less revealing because they combined the silk thread with cotton, flax, linen, or wool, as mentioned above. Also, it can be assumed that they were perceived as less luxurious because they combined traditional textile materials with silk. However, Given the highly politically charged discourses around the use of silk during antiquity and the excellent qualities of very fine wool and linen yarns available, choosing silk over those materials was always a conscious status statement. The value of the already costly silk could be heightened through precious dye stuffs. Most frequently, the texts mention purple dyed silk Purple was obtained from snails and often used for royal garments. You may remember that Cleopatra's silk dress was purple dyed. In his novel, the author Heliodorus lets ambassadors of the Ceres bring silk garments as gifts to a king. After him came the ambassadors of the Ceres and brought to him two garments, one purple and the other very white, the yarn whereof was spun by the spiders that breed in their country. The very white or very shiny silk points to Bombyx Mori silk. The Phoenician color refers again to the famous purple dye facilities in the Eastern Mediterranean. The author probably thought of imported silk yarns that were later purple dyed. Depending on the purple quality, these silks could be extremely expensive. Diocletian's Edict of Maximum Prices shows that blatter purple dyed silk yarn was nearly 13 times more expensive than undyed silk yarn. We read of white serica silk, one Roman pound that must not cost more than 12,000 denarii, and one Roman pound equals around about 328 grams and one Roman pound of Metaxa Blatte silk. Blatta purple silk in skeins must not cost more than 150,000 denarii. Late antique texts mention increasingly purple dyed silks and also silks that were embellished with gold threads. Together, these materials provided a splendid and extremely precious combination of colors and materials. Already the second century author Apuleius wrote about thieves who stole fabrics of silk and gold. In the third century CE, the Christian author Cyprian criticized luxurious silk garments that were interwoven with gold and hyacinth purple threads. In the fourth century CE, Gregory of Nyssa followed suit by arguing against the use of luxurious garments among which he counted the gold embellished and purple dyed silks bombu case of the series. Also in the fourth or early fifth century, the writer Prudentius tried to convince Christian believers to renounce luxuries like gems, bombu silks and purple that he argues they have to give up in death anyway. The criticism of the Christian authors reveals a similar dichotomy like the pagan texts. Between discourses and what was actually done was a huge difference. 
It also shows that the use of purple dyed and gold embellished silks must have been quite widespread among the elites. This must also have been true for the emperors and their family, even though moralizing liter literature in the fourth century CE still condemns the use of silks. We hear, for example, that among the garments of the emperor Commodus that was sold after his death was a half silk robe with gold threads of remarkable workmanship, and that the emperor Marcus Aurelius sold his wife's silk and gold embellished robe. The emperor Aurelian was purportedly also careful to avoid the most costly silks, both for himself, his family, and others. Clothing made purely of silk he would neither keep in his own wardrobe nor present to anyone else for his use. And when his wife besought him to keep a single mantle of purple silk, he replied, God forbid that a fabric should be worth its weight in gold. For at the time, a pound of silk was worth a pound of gold. In the year 398 CE, the court poet Claudian praised the child Emperor Honorius' purple dyed silken robe that he wore on the occasion of his fourth consulate and that was embellished with gold threads and precious stones from India, a so-called trabia. The Phoenicians contributed the color, that would be purple, the Saras, the warp threads, silk, and he does base in India, the weight. Here we have to add of the precious stones that embellished the silk garment. The silk fabric must have been heavy enough to bear the weight of the stones. Not only do the silk qualities seem to change or at least become available in many different qualities, also the way in which they were judged changed. If we leave the critical moralizing authors behind and look at the legislation, we can see that the emperors in the fourth century increasingly tried to monopolize the trade and production of silk and also the use of purple dyed silks. The first law was issued by Valentinian and Valens in the year 369 CE. It forbade the weaving for private use of decorative borders of silk interwoven with gold, paragaudai for persons of both sexes. The production of these textiles was to be the exclusive right of the imperial workshops. We forbid the weaving or making for private use of borders of gold or of silk interwoven with gold on garments for either men or women. And we command that such garment borders be made only in our weaving establishments. Another law that was issued in 384 CE during the reign of Valentinian, Theodosius and Arcadius stipulated, no private person shall be permitted to distribute any vestments made of pure silk as gifts at any exhibition of games. It seems that half silk clothes did not violate the monopoly of the emperors, since we know of a letter dated to 393 CE from the former consul Symmachus to the Vicarius Africae Magnillus in which Symmachus talks about half silk dresses, we do not learn in which shape they came, that he wished to procure for distribution at the games that marked the beginning of his son's new office as quaestor. Yet another law that was issued during the reign of Valentinian, Theodosius and Arcadius between 384 and 392 CE forbade every private citizen to dye wool and silk with precious purple. No private person shall be able to have the right to dye and sell the purple cloth, either in silk or in wool, which is called purple, blatter, or bright purple, oxyblata, and hyacinth. Also, the sale of purple dyed silks was not allowed, and anyone disrespecting the law had to expect the loss of all their assets and even capital punishment. It seems though that textile workers and dyers invented strategies to circumvent previous laws and to achieve the precious purple color with other dye stuffs. Because another law that was promulgated between 393 and 395 CE by Theodosius, Arcadius and Honorius 
forbade independent dyers to imitate imperial purple on wool and silk. Again, violations were punishable by death. We do not allow the dyeing of woolen cloth darkened with counterfeit to look like sacred purple dye, nor silk to be dyed pink and afterward to be darkened with another color, since the right of dyeing in all colors from white is not denied. For those who attempt what is not allowed will receive capital punishment. Moreover, between 384 and 392 CE, Valentinian, Theodosius, and Arcadius stipulated that only the Comus Comerciorum, the official who oversaw the trade at the frontiers of the empire, was allowed to buy silk from the barbarians, which forbade to trade silk for everyone else. As has already been ordered, we order also now that the privilege of purchasing silk from the barbarians be taken away from everyone, except for account of external trade. While these laws primarily sought to monopolize the production and trade of certain kinds of silks, the emperors also increasingly tried to monopolize their use. A law from the year 393 CE, issued under Theodosius, Arcadius, and Honorius, targeted the apparel of a certain kind of actresses, the Mimai. No actresses of memes shall wear gems, nor shall wear none shall wear silk with adornment in relief or gilded textiles. Of course, we do not, not forbid them to wear checkered and very colored silks and gold without gems on their necks, arms, and girdles. They were not allowed to wear jeweled silken garments interwoven or embellished with gold or silks embroidered or embellished in a certain way that probably created a relief effect. If we compare these silks with Honorius elaborate robe, it seems that the law was issued in order to reserve purple dyed silks that were embellished with gems and gold, exclusively for the use of the emperors. However, the actresses were obviously allowed to use scudlata damask silks, the weaving structure of which gave the already known checkered effect, and silk garments dyed in various colors. A multicolored silk chaplet is already mentioned by the elder Pliny. In fact, the chaplet deemed the smartest price is made of nard leaves or of multicolored silk steeped in perfumes. Such is the latest form taken by the luxury of our women. Also, the second century author Dionysius Periagetes compared the skillfully made garments of the Ceres with flowers on a meadow. The comparison of garments with flowers was common in Greek and Latin texts. However, none of them explain uh, what these colorful fabrics and in particular the silk fabrics looked like and what inspired the comparison. Were they monochrome silks and flower colors or polychrome silks woven in tapestry technique or with a repeated pattern or embroidered silks with flower motifs like the gorgeous examples from Palmyra that you see in the slide, we don't know. While colorful silks could still be purchased, in 424 CE, the use of the sought after purple dyed silks was severely curtailed by the Emperor Theodosius. He forbade both men and women of any order, profession and origin to own or produce purple dyed silk mantles and tunics that he reserved for his own use and that of his household. Moreover, all privately owned purple dyed garments were to be delivered to the emperor. The text states, all persons of whatsoever sex, rank, skill, profession or family shall abstain from the possession of that kind of material which is dedicated only to the emperor and to his household nor shall any person at his home weave or make silk cloaks or tunics, which have been colored with purple dye and woven with no admixture of anything else. Garments of all purple must be to surrender to the treasury and must be immediately offered. How difficult it was to enforce these monopolies, however, is shown by another text, 
Only 12 years later, in 436 CE, a law issued under Theodosius and Valentinia describes a case of treason in which nearly 300 Roman pounds of silk had been purple dyed in clandestine operations and witnesses had been tortured to confess. Although it seems to have been difficult to enforce the imperial silk monopolies, the laws give the impression that all violations were rigorously pursued. The initially, initially highly criticized exotic material that moralizing authors liked to attribute to Roman women with loose morals had become part of the imperial representation. To summarize, it could be shown that while Greek and Latin silk terminology distinguishes between wild and cultivated silk, the forms in which the raw material reached the West, skein, yarn, and fabric, and different weaving techniques, colors, and embellishments, it does not match the variety of archaeological silks known in the Mediterranean. The focus of ancient authors, when they distinguish between different silk qualities, lies firmly on fabrics that were produced in the West, namely entirely silken and half silken fabrics, scutlata damasks with a checkered pattern, purple dyed silks and silks that were embellished with gold and or precious stones. The legislation mirrors the growing interests of the emperors in the trade, production and use of mainly purple dyed silks and differentiates accordingly. Silks from the East were usually subsumized under the term for silks from the silk people or simply silks. Some of them, especially the splendid colorful Chinese pattern silks might also hide behind the comparison with flowers, but we cannot be sure. These findings show the limitations of Western silk terminology and the importance of combining archeological and written sources. Thank you very much for listening. And please find the editions of ancient authors and the acknowledgements for permissions at the end of this presentation.